Welcome to another edition of Grace Under Pressure, where my guests today are William Eggers and Don Kettle. I will tell you about each of these distinguished gentlemen in just a moment. Grace Under Pressure is the show that deals with what's so often dismissed as the soft stuff, the carrying the commitment. And when you do it from a leadership perspective, as both Bill and Don can provide, you do it with a common cause to making a better society, a better world. So welcome, William Eggers and Don Donald Kettle. So great. great I want to, to tell you. folks, I want to tell everybody about you. Uh, William Bill uh, is executive director of the Deloitte Center for Government Insights and a fellow of the National Academy of Public Administration, is the author of multiple books, including The Solution Revolution. If we can, we can put a man on the moon. And they're very brand new book. Um, the title escapes me. Jump in here, Bill. Tell me what the title is. <laughs> uh, Bridge Builders. Is Bridge Building. Title. Great. Um, and uh, Donald Kettle is Professor Emeritus, former Dean of School of Public Policy at the University of Maryland, and a fellow also of the National Academy of Public Administration, and he has taught and resides in Austin, where he has taught at the University of Texas. Uh, gentlemen, welcome to both of you. I have a statement that uh, I got from about the book that says that to, your thesis is that the dividing line between government and the private sector is evaporating. The ESG movement, environmental, societal, and governance is one inter, inter, uh, indication of what's going on. Many private companies are becoming quasi-public with a growing commitment to social goals and a growing role as partners with government to provide public services. So, Bill, what's happening? Why is this dependence on this, the private sector becoming more popular? So. Sure, and so John, about a decade ago, I wrote a book called The Solution Revolution, which was about how business, government, and social enterprises have been teaming up to solve societal problems. And a lot of what I did in that book was actually look at the massive growth of this purpose movement where businesses having a double and triple bottom line focused on environmental issues, social issues, and really trying to solve problems. And this was a big change from back in the 70s when, uh, of course, Milton Friedman said the only uh, real role of business is to make a profit and to deliver shareholder value, not to take on those other issues. But it turns out that it's actually very important uh, for business uh, to do that. John Mackey has talked about it in his Conscious Capitalism book and, and elsewhere. And since that time, we've seen this continual movement where businesses are spending hundreds of billions, if not trillions of dollars that they're investing in trying to solve societal problems from climate change to homelessness to workforce development. And so the traditional thinking that the private sector only exists to make profits and government agencies um, is just for is trying to dis, um, solve public problems is no longer true between because the old wall between profit and purpose is really collapsing. And you're seeing more and more businesses committed to addressing societal problems and really attracting talent also through social impact. And so what it means is that governments can have an important partner now in solving these problems. And the best governments are the ones really that are trying to leverage all of these resources, all of this talent and an investment towards public value. Great. Now, Dan, um, if you were to walk down the street and say, boy, I can't wait till um, government and businesses work together, people would look at you as if you had two heads. But that's <laughs> actually not the case because consumers are wanting, as Bill had mentioned, social purpose. They want companies to stand for that. So what is going on here, uh, Don? What, what's your perception of this transformation? So. It's a great question, John, because in many ways, what's going on is is below the headlines. And it's the kind of thing that most people really don't focus on. But even if people were to walk down the street, they'd be walking down the street on something where the private sector has in all likelihood created that public value as contractors to lay the concrete to begin with. Uh, I was talking to a former firefighter not too long ago who said that uh, we were talking about the, the, the 
tremendous change here in Austin uh, with all the skyscrapers going up. I'm sitting here watching uh, a 75-story building going up two blocks away from, from my house. And it's just stunning change that's going on. So I said, you, you folks in the fire department must have this dramatic problem in trying to find ways of, of resetting what you do. And he said, well, you know, we're putting out more fires these days by the fire codes that we write than by putting water on things. And what he always says is that the, the, the fire business is increasingly a, a business of trying to develop partnerships with the private sector, developing fire code standards that then private companies use to build safer and more protective kind of structures out there. And the fire codes that are being created are being done in partnership with the private companies to begin with. And so right. the idea of having a, a kind of private sector only or public sector only uh, stark dividing line between the two is something that has long since disappeared, but the, the effort to try to build bridges between them is becoming much more important in the way in which we create public value for citizens everywhere. So as we're building bridges, Bill, let's just top line a few of the benefits of the corporate and government partnerships. So there are really so many benefits of it. Uh, the first one is simply that you're getting a lot more resources uh, devoted towards public value. Let's take something like climate change. Uh, as John Podesta from the White House has noted and many others, it, <clears throat> to really get the kind of action that we need around the climate, government's a really important player right? from funding some of that, as we have saw with the Inflation Reduction Act, which was the biggest investment in climate that we've seen. But in, in the end, it's going to be the private sector that's going to be investing much, much more funds overall in climate than government is. So that means that government has to play this role as an integrator and a convener around those investments. And so if you look at the Inflation Reduction Act, you saw hundreds of billions of dollars worth of money going into things like tax credits and competitive grants and other things to try to facilitate this market transition to a green economy. And it's already been pretty successful in that the amount of applications for these has been much higher than was originally estimated. So it's just one example of how government has a lot of resources, but the private sector has incredibly considerable resources and you can't get the changes we need without the private sector actually being integrally involved in this and changing their processes, changing their goals around this and focused on, on climate. And so for government then, it, it's about what are the different tools that they have at their disposal uh, from tax, credit, tax credits to grants, to contracts, to other sort of tools that they can use to accelerate this market transition to a green economy. And that's why the sectors have to work so closely together. And that's just one example of many different big societal issues that we've focused on in the book, where it takes that kind of very close public-private collaboration to really make the changes that we need in our society. Great. Now, Don, um, you, in the book, Bridge Builders, you have a phrase, catalytic government. I'm assuming that doesn't apply to automobiles. So what does a catalyt the term catalytic government mean? So. I actually might even apply it to, to automobiles because the catalytic converter came out of regulations that California created to try to improve air pollution and re make it the air safe to breathe in California now as well. And so it really was a kind of collaboration between government and the private sector. It was California stirring the pot to transform the way that automobiles were being manufactured, not only in California, but throughout the rest of the country. But more broadly, what we have in mind by that is the fact that, that the government is not just any longer in a kind of command and control situation, like, like a vending machine where you, you put money in the top and push the lever and hope that the services come out the bottom. And if the government doesn't seem to be performing, that you just pull open the vending machine and try to rewire it on the inside. In, instead, what government's doing much more often is to act as a kind of orchestra conductor among the, the public and the private sectors, the, uh, the nonprofit world, federal, state, and local, even relationships with foreign governments as well to be able to get things done. 
And we see that what's really going on is this movement from a, a kind of vertical top-down system to a horizontal system where the government's job is not command and control, but it is instead pulling all the different players together. So again, to think back to the orchestra, uh, they create beautiful music together as a result. And we've seen some real good examples of that. The, in fact, one of the things that, that we discovered is that the, the, the a large symphony orchestra typically has about 70 to 100 players out there. In the effort to try to reduce homelessness, the city of Houston has put together a coalition for the homeless with more than 100 different organizations that's involved. So, so larger than any major symphony orchestra. And in the processes of the last five years, reduced homelessness by 63%. So it was moving instead from this effort to try to engage in command and control regulations to try to find ways to do it all itself, and instead moving to a system where government's role is much more catalytic to bring all the different players together and to try to build that kind of collaboration that's needed to try to produce better results. So we've really right. we, we've redefined accountability from something that have you dotted all the I's and crossed all the T's instead to whether or not you've produced the outcomes that you want. Right. Now, central to your book, are you've got these um, 10 key elements of bridge building, which I find very tangible and actionable. So I encourage readers to reference them. But let's take down kind of one of them. And, and it's one that plagues every organization, and it's uh, knocking down barriers and silos. How can you do that in a government agency, Bill? So. You know, this is – we started the book with this because it really is the the – first key thing that needs to happen where the walls need to come down both between government agencies and between government and the private sector because it's those silos whether it's in the around the data that's being shared or how services are being delivered that create a lot of problems and a lot of friction in the system and prevent us uh, from actually uh, dealing with the issue so going back to the issue of homelessness that Don mentioned um, so think about it this way. There, the, who's, who's really in charge of this sort of an issue? Is it an economic problem, a jobs problem, a mental health problem, a drug problem, a family problem, a criminal justice problem? Should it be a problem of government, nonprofit organizations, individuals, local governments or states, private sector? And the answer to these questions is yes for all of them. Yeah, I was just going to say yeah. you were ticking them off and I couldn't say no to anything. <laughs> yeah. So that solution must go beyond the old lines we've drawn to address them, um, which means essentially bringing in all of the different sort of organizations, nonprofit organizations, for profit, different government agencies that have a piece of this and getting them to coordinate and work together. And in a traditional sort of siloed system, there's no way to do that. You know, one of the things that Don mentions a lot is try to think of a single major problem or even a major service that's being delivered that can be solved by one organization alone today. It's almost impossible to come up with one. And that and that's the central reason why we wrote the book was because it takes that collaboration across agencies and horizontally. And that's something that there hasn't been as much written about from a public management problem. And when you look at how the media will portray this, they'll always try to blame one organization or another, one agency, when actually it's more of, as Don mentioned, this orchestra approach. And so that makes it more difficult sometimes for accountability, but it also enables, again, that resources of a lot of different organizations to be brought to bear on these wicked problems. I'm now a question for Don, because you mentioned it and you just did it again, Bill, and that's the topic of accountability. When you have multiple contractors or multiple agencies involved, people can hide behind the phrase, not my job. <laughs> so how do we how do we make a accountability of genuine value that people organizations want to adhere to? Don? Uh, the, the easiest way to duck out of the problem of accountability is that, of course, it's, it's always somebody else's fault. No matter what's going on, it's always somebody else's fault. But the reality is that if you talk to individuals, they don't really care who's responsible for delivering services. All they want is their problem to be solved. 
And it's a very simple problem of accountability from the point of view of, of the public out there, because if there's a fire to be put out, if there is an emergency in terms of uh, a natural disaster to respond to, if it turns out to be issues having to do with, with climate or job creation or refugees or migrants or you name it, they don't really care and often don't know, don't need to know, shouldn't have to know who's in charge. What they really care about is getting their problem solved. And so accountability increasingly, we believe, ought to be defined in terms of outcomes. Does the service system that we've created solve the problems that people have in the way that the people want to solve them, in a way that creates the least hassle for them along the way? The idea of having a system of accountability that's defined by individual programs or individual organizations or individual kind of vertical silos is something that not only is obsolete, but provides the kind of cover that you talked about so that organizations can hide behind those walls and say, well, you know, we did what we were supposed to do, but if there's a problem, it's obviously not us because it's somebody else. And the problem at the core is that it has to be the entire system working together. It's the same thing if you go back to the orchestra metaphor. If, if you can have what sounds like pretty good music, but if the, if the couple of violins are out of, out of sync, out of tune, it's going to ruin the way in which the, the music's played for everybody. So it's a matter of coordinating all these pieces to make them work. Now I want to twist this idea of accountability just a, a bit, and I'll throw this to you, Bill. The sense of does... Does government get enough credit or can it take credit or it doesn't seem to sing its own song the way the corporate sector does? What is your perspective on that, Bill? So, You know, I think if uh, it's funny, I was uh, once on a, I spoke at the National Government Association a number of years ago. And the person that uh, spoke right before me was Dan Bartlett. And Dan had been actually with the Texas government under uh, George W. Bush. And then he was the communications director in the White House. And he's now a vice president at Walmart, uh, where he leads all of their uh, communications. One of the things that Dan noted was that there's a lot the private sector can learn from government about crisis management, crisis communications. But what the government can learn a lot from the private sector is simply around, around marketing and effective marketing. And we've had this notion that uh, marketing or government programs and so on is propaganda or so on. And I think that's, that's a really false way of looking at things because whether it's looking at success stories but, or digital adoption of services or helping people to navigate, government needs to be able to communicate effectively to people about what their role was and so on. And that takes good communication. So we need to focus more on communications. And I would just note that a, a great example, I think, of this sort of public-private cooperation around accountability is Operation Warp Speed, which dramatically accelerated the development and manufacturing of COVID vaccines and diagnostics using a public-private approach. You know, traditionally that had taken seven years or more to develop a vaccine and they were able to get it done in six months. Um, how did they do that? Through this public-private collaboration where they were able to backstop pharmaceutical companies financially to free them up to invest heavily in vaccine development. They eliminated and lowered some of the regulatory barriers. They ameliorated risk. And at the same time, um, they gave a lot of uh, room for the private companies to innovate around those regards. And that combination uh, was really, really successful, historically successful effort. And I think that is an example where, you know, government did get uh, a good amount of credit for what happened because this wouldn't have happened without government playing, I think, that important convening and integrating role around the various players in vaccine development and distribution. Now, Don, I'm going to throw this to you because your background, you taught at the LBJ, I believe, School of Government. So that was certainly the namesake of that, believed in government, which maybe half our population does or doesn't. But then there's a sense of um, 
accountability and how do you know people say we pride ourselves on how little taxes we pay and for example in europe i mean no one likes to pay taxes but um i know citizens in europe feel that maybe they're getting more value for their dollar we don't have that concept here in the states because partisanship tends to trump governance do you sense that don so i think that's not only true but it's also becoming worse that we have, I think, increasing attacks on, on government and on the value the government can provide. And what's, what's even more difficult is that there is this overall sense that, well, government just doesn't work very well. And so what we need to do is just to, to either blow it up or at least to blow up individual programs that we don't like. But there was a really interesting survey done a couple of years ago by the Pew Charitable Trusts. And they went out and asked people, do you want to try to reduce the deficit? Everybody said, yeah, yeah, absolutely. There's a, a strong majority in favor of that. Next question. Okay, what programs would you favor cutting? And they went down a whole list of programs from veteran services to social security to even foreign aid. And it turns out that in every single case, more people favored keeping the programs and in some cases even increasing them than cutting them. So we, we hate government in general. Uh, we, but on the other hand, we'd love the government that we're getting. So I think the, the key to trying to deal with this is not to try to boil the entire ocean and convince everybody that government as a whole is wonderful, but instead, bit by bit, program by program, issue by issue, develop better systems that provide better value to citizens and taxpayers in exchange for what it is that they're putting in. And I think that uh, they may still not like at all the government overall, but when it comes to the services that they get and the programs that they count on, they can come back and say, oh, yeah, that wasn't quite so bad. And that when you, when you apply for a passport, if it comes back in, in three or four weeks, people say, you yeah, know, that was pretty good. Maybe government as a whole is not so good, but I really appreciate you get my passport on time. <laughs> yeah, I'll just add to that, John. Um, Please, Phil. You know, Don talks about the difference between wholesale and retail trust in government. And we've done a lot of surveys of that. So when you ask people in general, do you trust government and so on, the numbers are fairly low. They're at an all time high. But when you ask people about individual government agencies that they're getting services from, the numbers are much higher. And in some respects, they're they're fairly, fairly large and they're either equal to the private sector in some respects when they consider themselves getting good services. And one of the things we also found was that if they've got a great digital experience with government, state or local governments, and it's been delightful and they've been able to get their job done, they actually end up having higher trust in government. So in a way, that that's why this is so important. If you can get governance down and deliver services well, solve big problems, you're gonna also increase trust in government. That's why this is so important. Now, that's a great thought. And I think you guys have a, a window into how to do this because you talk about cultivating a cross-boundary leaders. And I'm saying that cross-boundary would be interagency as well as inter-contractor corporate. Is that correct, Donald? Or uh, how does that work? Yeah, that's, so. that's exactly right. Because if you think about the, the role of bridge builders, you think about them as orchestra conductors, what we have are some of the most effective leaders are not people who just find ways of making sure that all the grain in their individual silos are, are managed well, but instead can reach across the boundaries to accomplish these objectives. Because as Phil pointed out, it's really difficult to think of any problem that matters that any one organization can control. And we've got lots of examples in the book of managers who have succeeded to do exactly that from, from either the, the kind of grand scale of people like Thad Allen, who came into New Orleans after Hurricane Katrina and pushed aside the programs that weren't working and told everybody that what he wanted was to have everybody treat every person that they encountered as if they were a member of their own family and use that to try to focus on outcomes, to, to break down the barriers to make things work. Uh, but on the other hand, we have people like, uh, like Alan Graham here in Austin, who's created an incredible system to try to deal with the issues of homelessness by finding ways of building bridges across job training and healthcare and in housing and in a whole collection of other kinds of problems that have succeeded in providing vastly better care for the people who are experiencing homelessness and helping them get back on to, to their own homes in time. And so it's, it's the bridge builders who reach across those boundaries who are responsible for really creating the solutions that work. 
Right. You talk about the outcome driven things and one outcome I'm guessing as an outsider that doesn't get um, sung enough about William is um, the government through its contractors is creating jobs, which in turn creates income and more jobs. And why don't we know enough about that, Bill? <laughs> so, well, within the public management community, there's certainly been a, a, a lot written in, about that. And Don and I have both been writing about that for probably over 75 years combined. But yes, <laughs> look at look at a look at a place with a lot of um, you know, like a place like Huntsville, Alabama. Huntsville, Alabama has long been one of the defense hubs in the United States. Rocket City, I think where, they call it or something there. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, it's also where they have more engineers per capita than anywhere else in the country. And why is that? Because there's a tremendous amount of contracting going on in defense and space and other areas. And it's also an area where they've been able to incubate a lot of minority owned businesses and other small businesses. And it's really helped to really drive that economy to be very, very dynamic in that way. So you can you can see that. And at the same time, what a lot of the contractors are doing is they're taking best practices from all over the world, working with governments and being able to bring them to bear with those various agencies that they're working with and leverage leverage those best practices, leverage their technologies and talents. So it's an, it's another important area of blended government. And we, you know, we write about in the book that if you look at refugee resettlement, the organization office of refugee resettlement in uh, out of uh, the department of health and human services only has about 150 people uh, to, to resettle over 100,000 refugees. How do they do that? They do it through a complex network of large nonprofit resettlement agencies and over 300 different uh, nonprofit resettlement agencies locally and state and local government. So it's a very complex network that's involved enabling and there's thousands and thousands of jobs that are part of that. But the actual government point is it's a it's a very horizontal system. And that's the sort of system that we see more and more is important to being able to govern that effectively to realize the outcomes that you need. That's great. Well, gentlemen, we are racing toward the end of our allotted time, but uh, viewers of my show know, and I didn't get a chance to have brief either of you, so I'm going to throw you under the bus, Don. Uh, <laughs> so I ask every guest or guests a story about grace, and I think basically the theme of our ESG part of it is societal benefit, and you were talking about homelessness and the complexity of it, refugee resettlement. Uh, Don, does any story of grace that you've seen in your research come to mind? Um, is there something you'd like to add? So well, yeah, absolutely, because there's so many. One and one of the things that overall that has been so rewarding writing this book is that we really have a very positive view about what it is that, is, that government can accomplish, but can accomplish in partnerships. And the grace comes, I think, in the kind of inspiration that, that people like Alan Graham here in, in Austin have brought to things. It's He really grew out of a out of even a, a religious foundation to try to bring a kind of what he calls taco theology to the process of attacking homelessness here in Austin. And it has to do with the idea of of helping people who are experiencing homelessness in terms of creating community among them, not in providing services, but in building community. And the kind of leadership that it takes, the way of weaving the different pieces together, the way in which he really focuses on community first as his fundamental strategy and using that as a strategy for, for providing leadership is something that I think provides tremendous grace to the process because without that piece, the kind of success that he's had simply would not have occurred. That's a wonderful story. Bill, did you want to add something to that or uh, got to throw you under the bus too? <laughs> Well, I'll, I'll just mention one of the individuals uh, that we profile in the book is Paul Pullman, who is the former CEO of Unilever and someone who I'm sure uh, a lot of your listeners have heard about. And uh, uh, Paul was really very early to this world of ESG and focusing on sustainability and bringing his company there 
very, very early on. And what Paul did uh, was he worked very closely with major development organizations, international organizations, and, and really forcing the private sector to look at this notion of sustainability and social impact and take it very seriously and incorporating it not only into like a CSR sort of point, but making it at the very center of Unilever's overall corporate strategy, which proved very successful and transformational for the industry at large. Well, thank you. Uh, Bill Eggers, Don uh, Kettle, you have been wonderful guests. And the name of the book is Bill? So. <laughs> Bridge Builders. Fringe builders. Um, it's a must read, I think, for our time uh, uh, because it show it's it's heart of it is things are possible, even if on the surface they may seem impossible. So, gentlemen, Bill and Don, it's been a pleasure to have you on the show. And with that, we will close out.